So I'm a, I'm a newbie, and I really appreciate being at this meeting. So uh, in response to uh, the request, our funding basically is up front. My institute, you see, is a very unique institute. It actually has four universities that's part of it, uh, and I'm part of UMSIS. Uh, we were one institute in the past, but it's basically the Institute of Marine Biotechnology in downtown Baltimore. So if you're ever in there, you'll see us on the waterfront. So what I'm going to talk about specifically were two threats. <clears throat> Aquaculture now um, is, is the fastest producing food industry in the world. You see the numbers here that most recently it's $160 billion value worldwide. In the U.S., only $1.4 billion. We're far behind, uh, in fact, one of our largest uh, import deficits basically is seafood next to oil in the process. So the economists um, have talked about uh, the two aspects of this whole thing, the blue, revol blue revolution of growing fish and, and protein in the oceans, uh, and also the strategy of the thing. And, and the aspect of the tragedy was the fact that we were harvesting fish to feed fish. It was the biggest um, complaint about aquaculture, that we're going out and catching menhaden and alewives and so forth, rendering it down to fish oil and fish meal and then feeding it back. And that's not a sustainable <laughs> industry, basically. So if we look at uh, the major producers, uh, as probably expected, China is the largest aquaculture um, industry that we have currently going, with the U.S. being fairly far behind. Um, I think last year, 2014, more than 50 percent of the fish seafood products now are coming from aquaculture and no longer coming from fisheries. Our fisheries are overtapped. Um, and we basically, there are no un, undeployed ones. So if you go to the China Seas, basically, you'll see rafts upon rafts of algae being grown, uh, sea cucumbers, uh, various bivalves, and so forth. Um, with, without nutrients being added, uh, that's an important aspect, okay? So uh, for, uh, according to the World Bank, basically, uh, the, the prime source of seafood is going to be aquaculture in 2030. Um, but, but we need to do this in a sustainable ma manner, both environmentally, that is, we just can't go dig, uh, tear down a mangrove uh, in Thailand, basically, raise shrimp, and then leave in the process. Probably most importantly in the U.S., it has to be economically sustainable. Um, and if you look at how much we pay for fish per pound, typically most fish can be raised for two fifty a pound. So when you go in and you're, see, you're seeing that you're paying seven to twelve dollars a pound for a seafood product, you see how much the intermediate guys are making in the process. And it also has to be obviously socially um, accepted. Uh, a big issue for a long time. It's been ten years since we've had a genetically engineered salmon. And only now has it been, and not in the U.S. yet, it's being raised in Canada and, and actually in South America, is the engineered form of salmon um, on the market. So typically in the last four decades, 10 to 25 kilograms per capita of seafood. So this is not a minor food product humans are ingesting. Believe it or not, we produce more fish now than beef. And that actually shocked me. And there's a good reason for that. Beef, about 6.8 pounds of feed are needed to produce one pound. For the majority of all of our fish, it's one to 1.4 pounds uh, of feed, basically. So it is a, as a production system, it is our most efficient, even relative to chickens, believe it or not. But the problem is, is 50% uh, of growing fish is the price is, is the feed. And as I said, the, the problem had been in the past was that fish meal could never be replaced. It was a magic component um, that allowed sufficient growth of the majority, especially of carnivorous fish. So there's a heavy dependence. So um, no longer for our our plant-based people out here, we can now provide a plant meal-based diet that is completely sufficient for the majority of the fish that we culture. 
The added advantage when we remove fish meal, and this will never occur, the contaminant levels are lower in that final fillet of fish that you grow. And that's because fish meal will always have PCBs in it because of our legacy, and will always have methylmercury in it uh, in the process. So on the order of between four and five fold lower when you use a agricultural uh, protein mix. So why, and you see on my right, that's uh, my graduate student who's now down in South Carolina, Aaron Watson. I'm holding the old food. <laughs> He's holding the new food in the process. And you notice the coloration differences in the process. Why do we succeed? Because of this molecule. For those who know cat nutrition, why we can't feed dog food uh, to cats without adding taurine, the carnivores have a taurine requirement. So what we have found, basically, many of the carnivorous fish that we like to eat, tuna and so forth, have a taurine requirement in their diet. They get that normally from their normal food items. Fish meal has high amounts of taurine in the process. No fish, no, no plant proteins have taurine. And that's why everybody in the past failed, why no one was able to go below 15% fish meal. You guys, if you take two hour energy or you're in energy drinks, the major component is taurine, <laughs> whether you knew that or not. One gram. So we're growing fish. We can now uh, not have to harvest fish to grow them. Uh, here you see them, uh, the, the method that is being pushed worldwide because of, we have 71% water on this planet is to put it out in depends. This is actually off the coast of Caribbean. This is a very fast growing, growing fish called cobia. We have been pushing for a long while uh, urban aquaculture that is actually growing it uh, in our factories that are no longer producing things, but let's produce a product in it by using recirculating aquaculture systems. Same fish, same fish meal free diet. Uh, this is amazing, this, is, this will get to uh, two kilos in under a year. Uh, and this is a great fillet fish too in terms of production. Another fish, uh, this is the second largest cultured species in Europe, the gilthead sea bream. Um, and Europe in general has pulled their pens out of the Mediterranean and putting them on land now because of the environmental issues. We get harvest in 8.4 months with this species in downtown Baltimore. <laughs> um, in the Greece, it's about one and a half years in the pens. We have a density in our uh, recirculating systems of 73 kilograms per cubic meter. That's 0.6 pounds, that is a fish per gallon of water. Envision that, how dense that structure is. And the main thing is, and I'm going to get at the very end, I'm going to talk about the one expense is aquaculture is water. You have to be able to reuse that salt water on a repeated basis. And so for this entire grow out, we're only using 0.1% new seawater. Lipids can be completely replaced. We can now use algal oils to replace the fish oils. Remember that one of the reasons to eat fish is because omega-3s, specifically DHA for me, uh, in the process. Again, uh, on the issues of much, much lower PCBs and so forth. But here's the problem. <laughs> so the one threat that is not sufficient protein source to grow the, the species is gone. The U.S. And, world, and the world in general is phenomenal at growing soy, corn, and wheat. Those can now be used as protein sources instead of fish meal. But you have this issue for tilapia um, that you find in your market coming from Indonesia. That's algae. <laughs> That's heavy nutrient input. Because there's not a recirculating a sewage system basically associated with that, nature is taking care of that process. Well, the problem we have worldwide now, and you notice the poisonings that exist, um, are due to a set of algae. 
We have one who's called amnesic shellfish poisoning that describes the effect of domoic acid. It effectively <laughs> destroys your brain. Domoic acid is produced uh, by a diatom, and I'll come to this later on, I'll show you. The entire West Coast crab industry, for the first time ever, was shut down because domoic acid was found in crabs, and that was unique in the last two years. We have, for those who have been to Florida and the red tide and who have had asthmatic problems, we have brevitoxins being produced by the neuro, uh, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. We have another nice name, paralytic shellfish poisoning, which was responsible for 114 deaths in Nova Scotia um, a while ago. Diuretic shellfish poisoning, which we kind of describes the issue <laughs> in the process, really common. And then ciguatera for those who know not to eat uh, barracuda, barracuda down here, basically, because of ciguatera, which is probably the largest human intoxication event uh, in the world. It's everywhere on the East Coast and West Coast now. The incidences of these events are increasing, primarily because of nutrient input and climate change. Organisms that were found in the tropics are now finding their way farther north. We now have in the, in the Chesapeake Bay, for those who go to Puerto Rico to see the bio, bioluminescence, you can now actually come to the Chesapeake Bay and see bioluminescence in the south part of the bay because we now have a species that has now in, found its home, basically, in the southern part of the bay. So domoic acid is permit, permit, uh, pervasive. It's in our food products. And you notice all those poisonings were via uh, ingestions primarily, basically. Uh, brevitoxin uh, can be aerosoled in terms of effects, but the majority of effects in humans is from ingestion of food items, seafoods. The, the amazing thing is that this stomoic acid is being found um, in all the food chain. Um, and it, it can be depurated with time but, but it, it's, we're talking months in the process. For the first time ever, this event has reoccurred simultaneously on the West Coast and the East Coast, um, high latitudes. This a funny event called the blob <laughs> occurred on the West Coast in 2015, which was a, water, a warm water body mass, very large, about four, about four degrees higher, persisted for a long period of time and caused this whole issue of, of clam toxicity and, and um, crab toxicity. This shocked me when I found this out. Virginia is the largest producer of hard clams in the US, which I had no idea. Um, there currently is no screening for product uh, coming from uh, Virginia or the Chesapeake Bay for toxins. That's not true for Maine, that's not true for the West Coast. And it's something that I'm gonna beat on our people basically, because a single event like here occurred in the muscles, shut down that entire industry for a period of time where they have been screening. So harmful algae, if we put pens out in the oceans, are gonna be impacting our food production uh, big time. What about fresh water? Well, if you've kept wind of what happened to Lake Erie, where they had to basically uh, spend 500,000 bottles of water because their drinking water was contaminated with these toxins coming from freshwater harmful algae. Across the U.S., you almost are not going to find a lake that is not contaminated with microcystis. This is a uh, cancer-forming uh, liver hepatotoxin. Um, the storylines usually are, if your dog goes swimming in the green water, it will be dead in 30 minutes, basically, um, when the levels are high enough. And then we have this other very interesting group of toxins called anatoxin, which are very, fa very, very fast death factor name, <laughs> another interesting name. The issue with this, these are primarily freshwater algae that are forming due to he heavy nutrients. But for those freshwater bodies that empty into an estuary, 
These same products are now being found in the marine environment to surprising levels to the fact that it can be toxic. And that's all new. 30% of the lakes basically have microcystis contamination. And EPA just released, finally, the U.S. water, uh, drinking water exposure levels uh, for kids and so forth just uh, a month ago, which did not exist. And the reason why? Nitrogen. <laughs> if you look at where all those lakes are contaminated, because of our agricultural practices of, of high productivity and everything else, circulating levels of nitrate uh, are really, really high in our groundwater. Uh, the one level uh, uh, that I've been working on in a small pond, it's a Girl Scout camp, 42 milligrams per mil of nitrate every, every day throughout the year. Um, what the various uh, toxins from freshwater cause, cramps, vomiting, neurotoxins, actually, saxitoxin is also being produced by some freshwater algae, and then lingotoxins, and usually skin irritation is the normal problem. So how do we monitor this? Well, technology is helping us. Uh, for Lake Erie, uh, they didn't know it was coming until it was too late. Uh, and they couldn't shut off the intake water, basically, so they, they had to shut it down. The, the, the new satellites that have been put up are now sufficient to actually get down to distinguishing species. You see here, this is Lake Erie um, uh, from, the, from uh, Rick Stump's group, basically. And they, from this, you can now have an index, and usually cell number is directly proportional to microcystin levels. So you have some indication of early warning about not to go swimming and so forth. Really nice correlation between actual in situ cell numbers and the actual signature that they're using. So satellites are really helping on the coastal. And there's a new technology for us, basically. This is essentially called a flow cytobot. And that's Lisa Campbell you see on the right. And this was very useful. This is essentially an underwater microscope that takes 500,000 images continuously for a day, sends those images up to a pattern recognition, puts a species identification to that form, basically, and then we know those that are toxic or not. And she actually was experimenting three years ago with this in, of Texas A&M, had in a water column coming into where an oyster bed was. And for the first time ever, she saw dinophysis, which is the okadaic acid, the diuretic shellfish producing toxin, basically. And she was able to warn, because there was in the next week there was going to be an oyster fest from those beds. And they would have had a bunch of people with diuresis, basically, in the process. Uh, but she was able to warn them, and they were actually to get oysters from a different bed. This is now routinely being implemented on the West Coast and the East Coast. Um, and the Gulf of Mexico for early warning, because you get data that looks like this. This is images that that machine is taking real time, sending back via cellular data, and giving counts that look like this. You, you would never, big data, this, for us this is big data <laughs> in the process. And we can get into a whole bunch of interesting ecology questions and everything else. So. I'm going to end, and actually this is interesting, you're going to have a water management. Um, this asteroid-derived blue material that's on our planet, that's the recent thing from MIT that two million years ago our, our water came from asteroids, um, is a limited resource. And we have to figure out ways of using that water in an effective, recycled way without dumping our pollutants, basically, in the oceans. So my take-homes are pretty simple. Aquaculture is already feeding a major portion of the world. And as I said, it's the, lar it's the fastest producing food production industry that we have. It's got to be done in an environmentally, economically sustainable manner. We're pushing for doing it in uh, recirculating aquaculture in urban city environments, but it can be done also in pens and ponds. Um, and there is the potential, a single algal bloom will shut down an industry completely, especially if that product finds its way to a human consumption. And I'm done.